Hello, everyone. Welcome to Alpha's weekly webinar series. Today, we have a fantastic group of artists and another fantastic curator. Uh, I will let them introduce themselves because no one better than themselves to talk about, you know, how we all got here. So why don't we start with, with you, Sydney? Hello, um, I'm Sydney Williams. I'm an artist based out of New Jersey. I have a residency at Mana Contemporary currently. Um, it's kind of wrapping up. I am a painter. I make some installations. Um, I make very colorful work. My work depends on what I'm thinking about. And that is that. You'll have to come check me out. <laughs> <laughs> Renata, where did you go next? <laughs> Hello, I'm Renata. I'm a co-founder at Alpha, um, which I think you all know very well by now. And uh, today I'm going to be sharing a little bit of um, our side on the experience uh, on this amazing collaboration with uh, Carlina, uh, Sydney, and Rosie. Carlina. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Carlina Moeller, and I am the founder of Art Frankly. And I have teamed up with Alpha and curated a special collaboration with some artists, two of whom are here today, Rosie Quick and Sydney Williams. And we're gonna give you a little teaser for what's to come. Amazing, and to close us off, Rosie. <laughs> um, my name is Rosie Quick. I'm an artist based out of uh, Jersey City as well at Mana Contemporary. Um, I'm currently in Long Island, um, self um, self-distancing and um, I have a studio set up here which is great I work in um, I'm working currently between photography and painting uh, but I'm an interdisciplinary artist working in printmaking ceramics uh, but primarily painting perfect perfect so I think the first question I have for for the group and we can take it in the same order is to talk about you know one project or one experience that makes you want to move forward? What, what was that moment in your career that you knew that you wanted to be in the arts? Uh, and uh, how did that change your process, your life, whatever it was? Um, I think it was a bunch of collective moments in my life. Um, I guess the professional art world would be, I was Dorothea Rockburn's studio manager and I went to school for art education. And I went to school for art education for so many reasons that I was taken out of a lot of my normal classes in public school and put into resource room and, you know, like I was an IEP 90s baby. Um, and art was the first place in my life I felt successful. So I always kind of knew that was an avenue that made me feel alive. So I went through my entire life. Like I, draw, I was painting and drawing before I even talked. And then, um, but being a professional artist in the professional world, really it took, Dorothea and working in a studio and Dorothea yelling at me telling me I'm an artist um, not as an art teacher and that I need to do this otherwise it would be a shame so I kind of looked more seriously into what the art world um, was about but I always went to museums and galleries and I always felt most alive looking at paintings and feeling maybe what the artist has conveyed and um, like the energetic pull to art that can stand hundreds of years was always miraculous to me. So, you know, it always really put me back. So I'm honored to be in this world. Amazing, amazing. Renata, what was that moment for you? <laughs> um, I think the first time that I actually start, um, thought about like maybe um, working with art was when I was living in Paris and I, uh, that's when I took my first art history class and uh, until that point I had like no like big familiarity with the subject and uh, and I think I just fell in love with it because like when you're surrounded by history like and when you finally start understanding it a little bit better and I think that's, that was like the big leap for me, like when like I started understanding better contemporary art, like and, and being able to create the links like in between like, like past works like, and things which were like being created like nowadays, like, and uh, yeah, like it, it was just like amazing. And, uh, and moving to New York afterwards, like where you live and breathe 
part like it just it happened like it wasn't like uh as much of of a choice as like something that like uh, happened like in my in my life fantastic carlina <laughs> well i t not not quite as early as Sydney, I guess, but I too grew up in a very art-filled environment. My mother runs the Blinky Palermo Archive, and I was always surrounded by art and artists, uh, but it was really my first internship, which was at Sotheby's, and that kind of whetted my appetite for the rest of my career. And I had a fantastic experience. I had a wonderful woman named Gabby Palmieri as my mentor while I was working there. And it definitely was kind of the gateway drug, if you will. But I also quickly realized that the auction house world, although fantastic, was too commercial for myself. So I started working with galleries, working with artists, and that's really where I got the motivation and the inspiration needed to pursue a, a, a career in the arts. Fantastic. And you, Rosie, what started it a lot? <laughs> I'd have to say that uh, it was a collective of experiences for me, too. But in uh, high school, I was reading a lot of American romanticism. And um, at the same time, I was taking art courses. And then simultaneously, it seemed kind of like this technological revolution was happening where everyone was um, using handheld phones and and it seemed as if the world was around me was getting a little bit progressively more unaware and distracted by um, just kind of like everyday things and this technology. Uh, and art was, um, I was taking a lot of art courses in high school and it, it, I found that it grounded me and um, kind of connected me to my surroundings and um, made me a little bit more aware and I would say that um, now my practice is very based in this kind of meditative, um, reflective realm. Uh, but I think it all goes back to kind of this literature I was reading and um, kind of continued to hold on to throughout my uh, studies in uh, undergrad and grad school. I grew up surrounded by art as well. My mom's an artist, my dad is an art dealer. so. I kind of like tried to avoid it for as long as I could and then ended up coming back like full circle. So I think it's something that, you know, you, you, you have as a calling maybe, you know, to be creative and to be surrounded by creativity. So we're very lucky to be able to do this amazing thing. Uh, but I think we should talk a little bit more about, you know, how this partnership came to life. Renata and Carlina, like how did the two of you meet? what motivated, you know, Art Frankly, which is a, a platform more for art jobs to be collaborating with Alpha. Back in 2017, when I moved and we moved Alpha to New York, um, we, it was when we personally met in person, they like, can got to talk about our projects, our objectives, they like, can Art Frankly and Alpha, they like, are such different products. I think there was a lot in common about like using technology to create more opportunities like, and, uh, and really like more connectivity. And we've flirted with the idea for a really long time. And uh, now like I would say that's like probably one of the best things that came out of this uh, whole crisis that we're going through that like we finally had the opportunity to like make this project come to life. I recall the first time that I met you and Manuela in um, your office. Rockefeller Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Now, although our websites do such different things, our mission is there's so much synergy between the companies. And it's really, you know, although art, frankly, is a platform to find jobs in the art world, it does also service artists and allow them to discover opportunities and to build an online professional presence. And when I met with the Alpha founders, you know, although it's a sales platform and it's a limited editions and this, the, the synergy of our companies was to help 
democratize and bring access to arts to underserved communities and to connect mm -hmm. the whole art world in that essence. So our missions were so aligned and, you know, as Renata said, we always discuss doing something together and, you know, maybe that is one of the silver linings of a pandemic is, you know, that to-do list gets crossed off slowly mm -hmm. and slowly. And so, yeah. you know, we connected in April and decided that now is a perfect time to launch a collaboration between the two companies and to bring new artists like Rosie and Sydney on board and to give them a new platform in sharing their beautiful yeah. works. Uh, so we're really delighted that this has manifested now and that we are launching and I invite all of you to go to Alpha's website and really check out these works because they are beautiful, they are affordable, they will make any home office work environment better for, for you. Mm -mm. No, 100%. And, and Carlene, how did you meet Rosie and Sydney? How did, you know, they come about? <laughs> so as they both said, they are both at the MANA Contemporary um, Community and they have their studios there. Uh, I started the NANA residency program years ago, so we all have that in common. But Sydney and I first met when she was working at Dorothea's studio. Um, Isabel Pignol, my co-founder with the MANA residencies, she and I are working on a project with Dorothea at MANA that is forthcoming, which we are also very excited about, so stay tuned for that. Uh, so Sydney and I met that way and just gravitated towards each other. And this is a beautiful accident that has happened from a different project. And I think that's something that we probably all share in common is that, you know, the art world is so interconnected and you never know who you're going to meet and what may be born from that meeting. It may be completely different than what the meeting originally was intended to be. And this is a perfect example of that. Rosie and I actually have never met in person. So <laughs> Rosie and I had studio visits scheduled. I think the first one was scheduled around our Basel Miami time, and then we had to postpone it to March, to mid-March, unfortunately, which obviously was further postponed. So, you know, Rosie and I have a lot of mutual friends as well, and we have a lot of mutual contacts. And so it was an easy without being able to meet in person, meeting online and reviewing her work and collaborating with her was just as organic for, for us as well. And Rosie, I can't wait to meet you in person. Uh, <laughs> so one day soon. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really how these two artists came to join this collaboration. And we do have two other artists as well um, in this collaboration that are not on this Zoom call, but you'll be able to see their works on Alpha's website as well. Yeah, I think they're right here. Yes. Ping. Ping and, and Caroline Silverman. Yeah. And Caroline Silverman, yep. Amazing, amazing. And you know, Carlene, what questions would you have for, for Rosie and Sydney? Uh, it's always interesting to hear this dynamic between curator and artist and what you know what things do you look for sorry i just wanted to add something like i think like if you could help us like really like understand their universes a little bit better like in terms of process like inspirations and what brought brought you to their work of course and I, you know i will let the artists speak to their practice but mm -hmm. one of the reasons why i was gravitated to sydney and rosie's work pre-COVID and then very much through COVID is their use of color and this bold expressions. Um, I think now more than ever, we are all turning to the arts for sanctuary and for inspiration and for meditation. And you are, I think as a curator and as a visitor to different you know, websites and to different artists' practices, you really have the time to think and look and see what you're gravitated towards. And there's something extremely ethereal about these two artists' works that always drew me in and was very elegantly gentle. And I think, you know, I have always been a big proponent that art should be beautiful and you should like to look mm -hmm. at it. And I like to look at both Rosie and Sydney's work and something that I've always 
led with in my curatorial projects is it's a gut instinct. It can, it can be as simple as that. And my gut tells me that these are both very talented artists and I'm very excited to see where they're going to go in their careers. That's so nice. And so Sydney, why don't we talk about your process right now? Because it's it's really incredible what you've contributed to this collaboration. And I, I know our viewers would probably love to hear a little bit more about them. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, sure. So my work in general is really reflective um, of what I'm thinking about. Like I try and create the most amount of headspace in my brain that is just so I can really think about what's important. And I think that's what being an artist is. It's like commitment to prioritizing the life that you want to live, deserve to live, or, you know, whatever, whatever meant to live, whatever that word might be, but kind of whatever draws you in. This work is called Beginnings um, because I was really starting my career. I've always been an artist, but I'm learning how to be a painter and maybe a painter in the art world. So this was my way of saying, this is, um, this is who I am and I, I'm just gonna grow and I, you know, I, I am willing to start with beginnings. And I'm willing to start as a new day as a beginning, as a new minute as a beginning, as allowing there to be multiple beginnings. Um, Cause I think that's really important the surrendering to just the, having the moment kind of be bigger than you are is a beginning. Work is um, scroll in and out. It's a series of 16 by 16 squares. And it's basically, it went off of work about how Instagram has been the formative media of sharing work and how I do believe that like social media and the internet and Instagram, it really does break up your presence. Um, so when I feel like I go on big backpacking trips to help digest my life and just really like, I like to walk and think. It's a real passion of mine. And I feel an unbelievable sense of presence and grounded and connectivity when I don't have my phone, when I'm not available to even a town or a cell phone service or Wi-Fi. Like I, you really feel a presence that it's not you in the world, but it's the world and you are connected. It's all one, you know, your thoughts become, wow, I'm stomping on these tree roots. I wonder if they feel, you know, like your mind really wanders to be a part of a giant, world and it feels good to be that small in a giant world so as i come back into you know new jersey new york maybe like tighter quarters whether that's mental space or physical space and so maybe both um i think really the presence of scrolling in and out of even talking to yourself through your art looking at other people and judging them on instagram because that's human nature it really disturbs your presence so this was these circles are kind of like the way to hypnotize like uh, Instagram or your phone can often do. And the lines are jutting in different directions because that's how quick your thoughts unconsciously change. Um, so this was really an exploration of like, how am I really moving into the world and putting my work out there? Um, just because you know, a lot of being an artist is alone and you have to put your art out there in some way. Mm -hmm. And this was, that just finished right before COVID. Um, that work was the last work I really did in the studio before COVID hit. And this work is called Eyes Bound with Intention. Um, and when the pandemic kind of came barreling through, um, like many people, I really was taken back. Um, I, had a, I had to have a period of grieving, of grieving what I've lost or of grieving what's changed or really kind of coming to terms of all of my anxiety, like that was all just real and myself and very self-induced and that we're all again in this together. And again, that your perspective is powerful. So I'd get on my yoga mat every day and some days I couldn't even do yoga. I would just sit and I would pray. And I've had mala beads, which are 108 beads. I've had a strand of rosewood mala beads since I was 15 um, is when I first got them. So I've been praying with the same 108 beads for over 10 years and I've always bound prayer with intention in my yoga practice and my yoga teacher um, huge part of my life 
So as I sat there and I got returned to my yoga mat and I returned to pray, I wasn't praying for myself. I was praying for the state of the world. I was praying for freedom for all and relief for all. And all of these, um, there's a prayer called Loka Samastan Suki No Bhavam Tu. May all beings everywhere be happy and free. And then my thoughts, words, and actions contribute, contribute to that intention. So I really was going to my mat with that intention. So I called up everyone I knew and I said, what's your prayer? How are you getting through this time? What's your intention? Um, how are you, you know, what, is, what are you saying to yourself that's helping you get through? And then I would sew them together. So it would be, you know, my friend that lives in Texas, so to my friend that lives in Virginia, who would never meet and their prayers and intentions were woven together and stitched and that made a unit that was stronger than they could ever believe and that maybe their words of somebody they'll never meet were bound together. Um, and it was really interesting how the prayers and intentions changed, especially as Black Lives Matter project arose. I started this project just in the beginning of the pandemic, so it really took on kind of this emotional body of the pandemic as well which um, maybe made some became more protest oriented. Um, my friend Virgo, his was just militant. And we had a lot of, and then it was a great way to talk to my friends about how they're feeling about the pandemic. Um, and then I eventually bought this project to bring me back Bowery, which is a mural project in New York City. And it was basically, I wanted the spirit of this project in collaboration to go to a really hurting unit, um, which is New York City right now, which is Bowery, it really, you know, like there's a lot more homeless people than ever in the city right now. And I became friends with a lot of them, um, chatted with them, heard their stories through COVID. And this intention prayer was for them. It was for people to look at and, you know, really be reminded that one of them was hope, love, freedom. And that was really for everyone on the street. And then listen is really for all the passerbyers. Passer-goers. I don't know. My grammar's always off. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from Brazil, so I can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> the English, any, any language was hard for me, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm where I am. But, so you have art. Art is your language. Art is your language. It's universal. We, we yeah. always say that a picture is worth a thousand stories, and it really is. Like, that was really special, Sydney. Thank you for sharing. Like, yes. Yes, of course. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I learned yesterday? Like now that we're just like on a, a quick bender, this signal actually realigns your left and right brain. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. It always reminds me of the Gabrielle, Gabrielle Orozco, my hands on my heart. Yeah. Um, mm. You know, like I, I love that work. And namaste is just the light in me, humbly bows to the light in you. Yeah. And Maybe it's just that is always such a it's like such an acknowledgement that we are a unit that we are sisters that we are brothers that like really we're all connected we're, we're preaching a universal language to a universal experience human being a human fantastic fantastic <laughs> thank you Sydney that was great oh, thank you Rosie tell us more about yourself and the inspiration behind some of the works that we chose and just in general as a, an introduction into your practice. Absolutely. Um, like I said, my, I pretty much started my career in painting, uh, but in grad school, I got more into uh, studying ph photography and the history of photography in relation to painting and painting's history. And, um, Photography, I, I've always had a love for it. My mom has this closet in her house uh, that is just developed photos that she was never able to put in, a, uh, in photo books because I have three older sisters and we were all born very close together. So I think life just went very quickly for her. But um, I would find myself kind of looking through these photos um, all the time when I would go home. And um, so I naturally started to develop photos that I had taken. And um, I noticed that with the smartphone and iPhones that were so able to take photos all the time and when film was invented, um, film was so precious and it's kind of lost that preciousness. So in grad school, I started to go back through 
um, all the like the 15,000 photos I have on my computer and handpicking which ones were actually genuine moments where I felt this um, kind of like an equilibrium in a moment. And um, my practice kind of turned into uh, spending time with these photos and reflecting on the moment of actually being there and what made me want to take them. And um, they're all these, um, they're all kind of just, um, sorry, they're kind of my starting point, my sketch process of how um, I go into my paintings and my kind of springboard when I go into paintings. But I uh, paint with this lilac gouache on top of them because this is kind of color that I identify with an equilibrium. Um, and I think that now more than ever, it's, it's really important to have these moments in your everyday. Mm -hmm. Something that's so striking to me, Rosie, about your work too, and, and this goes to your work too, Sydney, but in a very different way. But Rosie, your work is so hauntingly familiar. Like every photograph, we've all kind of seen some version mm -hmm. of that at some point. And especially the more, the further, the, the ones where you can actually see where you are. So this one is definitely more abstract that's on the screen right now, but the ones with the beach scenes and the sunsets and the sunrises, they're, it's, a, and I feel like that's something that your work very much evokes is this, I've been here before, I've been, I've been that moment and it makes you feel a lot of the feelings when you think back to that moment. So it's very interesting in that way. Thank you. Yeah, some of them I think are very, um, I don't wanna say cliche, but maybe cliche. And then some of them are kind of like these moments that you would think are really um, kind of like banal, uh, but you feel forced to take this photo for some reason. Um, and I think that, yeah, you can have these moments at any point in your day and, um, yeah. You're almost nostalgic, no? I feel like you're in a, a, a separate dimension of time. When were the actual pictures taken? Like how far back? Um, so the, these, uh, larger format ones were taken a couple years ago, um, the, um, they're from all different places. These, this was actually taken with um, a camera that, a, a non-digital camera, it's a Minolta camera, and um, it's like a 1980 uh, model that my dad had given me. And this is kind of a place that we go in the summer and um, it brings back family memories. This project in particular, I, I love because I, I had a show at Mana in November where um, each series of work was taken with a different camera. And um, so this is a moment, um, the same moment from all different perspectives. And the, the um, other photo with the kind of crisscross was taken with a digital camera. Um, and this was more about kind of the reflective, this point of, vision where you're, you kind of find yourself in a reflective gaze. And uh, that's why I titled these. Um, and then those other photos uh, in the show were kind of meant to be, um, meant to replicate kind of like a precious object, um, like a daguerreotype. Um, so, and then I wanted to try kind of larger format ones. So this piece on such a winter's day and the uh, summer gala are both larger format. Um, this is something I wanted to experiment with. Yeah, the work really does change when you change the format size, et cetera. We see this all the mm -hmm. time with our prints. Every now and then we get like a work which was massive large scale and we end up making it smaller and, and the artist is like, oh my God, it's like a complete new work. And we're like, yeah, it's, it really does change the way that you, present the work. 
And so that's why it's it's amazing to start work with start to work with editions because it it it, it brings forward a medium that's easy to digest, you no, know, and it's perfect for the virtual world that we're living in. It's it'll adapt well from a screen to a person when you know if you're working with an oil or if you're working with something which is larger screen, you really do have to see that piece in person to experience the energy that it gives out. Absolutely. I also think that uh, different scale at a different scale, the viewer is interacting with a piece differently. Um, so if it's really small, you're you're coming up a lot closer rather than a larger piece when you're standing a little bit away from it. Well, fantastic. I think you know there's there's a question that we've been asking all of the, the, the participants since we started like this webinar series. What have you been doing to stay sane? I, I know things are a little better now, restrictions have been lifted, we're able to see people to go outside, but you know, uh, maybe we can go in the same order that we started, like Sydney, Renata, Carlina, and Rosie. Uh, what are, what's an activity that you're doing, a book that you're reading, a food that you're eating, something to, to comfort you through this, this period of such uncertainty? Definitely my yoga practice and painting. I'm, and I guess I, I got to um, escape to Vermont uh, during the 4th of July weekend. And that was really nice to spend a nice night camping, like alone on a lake uh, with my boyfriend, which was great. Um, but really like it's returning to like this commitment to just honoring, you know, like not what you should be doing, not the life that you should be building, but the life that is yours, that is precious, that is like really if you tap into it, it's everything that you need. So really being uh, doing activities that remind me that I don't have to build anything um, really helped me kind of return back to this moment of like gratitude um, in general, just like I'm really grateful that I can draw and I'm really grateful that I can, you know, like that I have outlets that make me feel really comforted during uncertainty. My know. time. <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're trying to think. Um, I think like I kind of like enter a phase two, like also a pandemic uh, in a personal uh, uh, level. Uh, and, and I think now that things are reopening, I'm just like really enjoying like uh, seeing like my friends like and and I, I'm kind of like loving the way that like the city is lately, you know, like with uh, tables outside, it, it feels so lively, like and uh, and uh, and also like the weather being good. I think like what that like means to me is that like in a way, people like people's nature is like to be happy, like and to be together, you know, like because like you see like whenever you give them. An opportunity to do that and to be that they like, they they take it you know like so so I've been like quite like impressed like with like the the vibe and the mood like lately um, so yeah <laughs> that has been like my my thing uh, in the past couple of weeks. Carlina, <laughs> besides the constant cooking cleaning and feeling bad about not exercising <laughs> um, let's see I, I I've definitely been reading more and I recall in middle school we had 30 minutes every day that's called dear d-e-a-r and it stood for drop everything and read and I've actually kicked that back into motion and mm -hmm. that has been has been really good and it's always, I mean, even since middle school, I've always tried to be disciplined with that, but I actually have the time to do that now. And I would say that the thing that I'm, I feel most grateful for is instilling a work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of really shut off my phone now at six o'clock. Like anything that comes in in the evening can wait until the morning now. And I've taken back my weekends, which is just delightful. Um, I don't <laughs> on the weekends or I try not to. And just being more mindful of 
all the other important things, which it sounds like, you know, we're all in agreement there, but just slow down. Like it's okay to slow down. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the simple pleasures like cooking, like I always enjoyed cooking. I, I have always cooked a lot, but you know, just, every day thinking of a new recipe and challenging yourself or reading something that you're not comfortable reading and doing it for self-education and these you know it's i think there's there's a return to just the basic inner reflection yeah and the basic yeah. i think is really wonderful and i actually think in the arts that's going to be very impactful and i think there's going to be more critical discourse and more engagement from artists to active participant whether that's a collector a, an enthusiast um just a viewer but you know the art world is not as busy now with flying from every fair to every fair and checking everything that's happening it's it's there's a little bit more peace and i think our industry definitely needed, needed it that. yeah yeah agreed 100 percent. and any good books like with all of the reading I, I, time <laughs> right now uh, soul of an octopus which actually me you that made me that when you were talking about putting your phone being uh distracted by social media and x y and z um, this book talks about the spirit and the octopus which is not octopi i also learned it's octopus um <laughs> the plural and it's fascinating this book i i am not convinced that i like the way this writing style but i don't tend and i'm actually really excited about the next book that i'm going to read and since this is a all female now it's it's called Ninth Street Women. It's about Helen Frank Frankenthaler and and all the the women who were kind of overshadowed colleagues uh, working in New York City. And so I'm I'm excited. Street Women on Audible and it, it being read to you is like a different experience if you want to consider it. It's worth mm. it. If you guys could write it in the chat, say, just so if you, if anybody wants to like look into it. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, Rosie. <laughs> um, it was definitely a shock for me at first. I mean, as to everyone, and still is. But um, I think I I found a lot of solace rereading um, Robert Gober's book, um, "The Heart Is Not a Metaphor," and. Um, I think that it's so well written. It's written between him and Hilton Owls. Um, and then a really funny book um, is John Waters' uh, Role Models. And I think that everyone should read it. It's so, it's so weird and it's so good and funny. Um, so I, weird, <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> so, I, and I, I mean, I've been really lucky. Um, I was able to see the studio which is actually bigger than my, in the attic here, which is, it's bigger than my studio in Jersey City. So um, I'm lucky. <laughs> I've been continuing it. That's, I'm blessed. <laughs> Amazing. Well, it's so nice to be in a group of only women. I only realize now, I think, you know, we're here at Alpha, we're, we're <laughs> always like so surrounded by women that we never even noticed that, you know, uh, we're, we're doing it. It's just unconscious, I guess, putting the female energy out <laughs> We're not there. against men. It just happens to work like this. <laughs> <laughs> we have nothing against men, I promise. Okay. <laughs> but they, when they write the history books about 2020, they'll remember a company <laughs> that was always featuring female artists. <laughs> 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 they just happen to be the best. <laughs> <laughs> they just happen to be better. Yeah, yesterday at, 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 I was at, at one of my last lec lectures at a course that I'm taking at Stanford, and I didn't pay the guy to say this or anything. He's just like, you know, it was a, an investment workshop, and he just pulled up the data, and, uh, and female-founded companies are 30% more profitable. That's, that's statistics. Even though we're grossly underfunded, we only receive about 2% of the VC capital. And if you're a Latina like us, it's only 0.2%. We're still 30% more profitable. 
So, you know, and I guess the arts, if we look at female artists, like it's the same thing. There's the talent is, is just there. We just have to provide more opportunities for minorities, women. So always look for us and we'll be putting forward a, a diverse uh, group of people. So thank you so much, girls. I don't know if anybody has anything to add, but if not, I think this is the point that we wrap up, sadly. <laughs> Go check out Sydney and Rosie's prints on Alpha. They're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this video is going to be available in the plaza form as well. Uh, so if you guys liked it and want to go back like and uh, watch it again and they go back to a certain uh, point of this conversation, it's going to be available over there. And so are all of the amazing webinars that we've been hosting. So definitely check out the video platform and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.